Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to welcome you to our third webinar in this series on the promotion of legumes in Europe. I'm very happy to give this introduction jointly with my colleague from INRA, Marie Benoit Macrini. And um, basically, today we will mainly present results from the leg value project. A few technical comments. We will give a short introduction now. Um, each video afterwards will be introduced shortly. The videos are mostly pre recorded. They will be between five and 10 minutes. During the videos, you have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat function and we will try to answer them directly. If you have more general questions, we will have a general discussion at the end and we would be happy that you bring uh, your questions, comments um, into this final discussion. We plan to have the overall um, presentations with a duration of around 80 minutes and hope that we can finish the whole format within 90 to 95 minutes. So we can go to the next slide. So I will pursue. Thank you, Marcus. So you know that legumes are facing many difficulties to develop because they accumulated uh, different breaks, uh, such as uh, they have a few investments in grading sector as regards the development of uh, certified seeds uh, compared to other crops. Uh, they encounter lower running and processing knowledge. And so, uh, because of these um, difficulties in getting more knowledge to allow them to develop, um, we decide to better analyze this question of uh, development of knowledge. So, technical knowledge, but also as regard information, as regard uh, markets. So, legume related information is also weekly structured. Um, concerning markets uh, as regard volumes and prices referring to various legume types, qualities and end uses. And both this problem of technical knowledge and market knowledge is related uh, to the diversity or to the heterogeneity of market structures and uh, diverse niche markets and by studying their organization, uh, what we mean the coordination through the value chain, uh, we want to answer how this coordination could help to improve the knowledge on legumes, both for technical, but also by considering um, economic information as regard market. So on the next slide, um, on the next slide, uh, we, we call the main objective and hypothesis. Um, so we have two main hypotheses. Highly coordinated supply chains favor stronger long-term investments and thereby preconditioning legume cultivation, processing and marketing. And during the presentation of this webinar, we will try to show you that effectively a stronger coordination in value chain will allow uh, better progress on legumes. There is also this question of market transparency as regard information and data on markets. Um, more market transparency to increase market information will also facilitate supply chain coordination. So the two hypotheses are strongly related. Um, so one of the main objectives of the Lake Value project was to analyze market transparency, how markets are organized and how added value is created in value chain. So this webinar will uh, sum up main results and uh, will give the floor to various stakeholders uh, that were implied in the leg value project. 
their presentations will highlight important market developments that exist on legumes. Um, it will present success stories on food, but also on feed outlets for specific value chain, summarize patterns on how to organize value chain, and those success stories could be a kind of lesson for other stakeholders that want to develop legume value chain by outlining uh, how networks linking farmers to outlets could be reinforced. So we will start the webinar now. Um, we will start the webinar by a first presentation of Marcus. So uh, let's use the floor now, Marcus. Youth, Marcus, you didn't put your micro on. Yeah, our presentation is pre-recorded. Um, while it is presented and you have technical question of understanding, you can ask them in the chat function and I'm happy to answer them. But now we can start with the pre-recorded presentation, please. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our presentation about possibilities to incentivize legumes through more transparent market information. My name is Markus Mergenthaler. I work as a professor for agriculture market analysis and agriculture marketing at South Westphalia University of Applied Sciences in Germany. I've worked with Bruno Kitzia in the Leg Value Project. Bruno, can you also shortly introduce yourself, please? Yes, thanks. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bruno Kitzea. I work as researcher in agricultural marketing at South Westphalia University of Applied Sciences in Soos in Germany. Before telling us something about this slide, can you remind us how important dry peas are in the EU? Yeah, of course. Um, after soybeans, dry pea, also known as um, field peas, is the second most produced and consumed grain legumes in the EU. Numerically, the EU is self-sufficient in P. Self-sufficiency reaches 120%. This graph presents um, the main trade flow of dry peas in the EU. So um, the number here are yearly average from the year 2014 to 2018. More interesting in this graph is the highlighting of the main player with their role on international market. So France, Lithuania are the largest producer and also the most exporter of peas in the EU at the moment. The main destination during this time period was India for food up to the year 2017. But due to the introduction of import taxes in India, this market was closed and as consequence, internal trade in the EU increased. So reduced export opportunity have had a negative impact on the production of some EU country like Romania. At the same time, especially in 2018, a conjunctural demand of pea for feed in Spain was observed. So the main supplier here was Russia, Ukraine, and Romania. So can we conclude that there is a vibrant and flexible trade of field peas in the EU? Yeah, um, peat rates in the EU is indeed characterized by a fluctuated and um, instable trade tonnage. Here we see that the trade of faba beans is mainly led by exporters to the Egyptian market for food. The main suppliers here for this period are UK, Lithuania, Latvia and France. We can also see that Norway might be a potential market in the future. The main use of faba bean is fish feed in aquaculture there. I will add that the brush beetle is a major hindrance for the continuous development of faba beans market for food sector. Mm, this is a pest problem in faba beans that reduces the optic quality of faba beans? Correctly, and it has consequence for the export possibility as infested faba beans are not qualified for exports. Based on this trade flow, we can see that the EU is a net exporter of faba bean, like it is the case also for dry pea. Now we will switch to another crew of grain legumes for which the EU consumption is totally dependent on imports from 
outside the EU? Yeah, in this group, you can count uh, chickpea, lentil, dry peas, for dry beans, for example. So <clears throat> as Marcus just mentioned previously, European countries are not self-sufficient in chickpea. So um, Spain, Italy, UK, and France are the main consumer in the EU. And in the EU, the main producer are Spain, France, Italy, and Bulgaria. To cover the demand in Europe, Argentina, Mexico, US, and Australia are the main supplier here. So this might give an indication that there is potential to increase chickpea production within the EU. At least if we assume more favorable policy framework conditions and a better adaptation of chickpea varieties to European climate conditions. Same here for lentil. The EU consumption totally depends on imports from outside of the EU, especially from Canada, followed by the US and Turkey. The main consumers in the EU are Spain, France, Italy, Germany, and UK. Lentil production in the EU is a tiny niche market with some local specialities. Exact, whereby France and Spain are the first producer in the EU. So in general, these graphs we present you, namely for dry peas, faba beans, chickpea, and lentil, shown the trade flow of legumes in the EU in the last couple of years. That's true, and we think that it would be important to continuously update such graphs to better inform policy and market actors about the developments of legume markets. More transparent and easily understandable information about market developments will give actors more confidence in these markets. This is a necessary precondition for a sustainable development of grain legume markets. Now let us look at a crucial topic in market in the development of legumes, namely the prices. The markets for legumes, respective prices and price determination mechanisms are not very transparent in crane legume markets. We are talking about the niche market. However, transparent price information of legumes is crucial for market-induced development especially information that reflects the value adding potential of crane legumes. For this reason, we have developed different price indicators that better reflect the value adding potentials. Here, we have developed and proposed price indicators for fava beans and field peas. So to this end, we use three approaches. The first approach is based on the multiple regression reported prices of green legumes are explained by price in related feed market, for example, by wheat and soybeans meal prices. This approach reflects price developments in the lowest quality of green legumes within past market structures. The second approach is based on the determinations of the feed value of legumes in animal production. This approach further distinguish between conventional and non-GMO qualities. And then there is a third approach, which derives a price indicator from foreign trade data as unit value. This gives an indication of added value of crane legumes in food production. If unit values from foreign trade data are used as price indicator, we suggest to rather use the unit value of the net trade position. What does this mean? Well, if a country is a net exporter of faba beans, unit values from export should be used as a more reliable price indicator for added value in food production. On the other side, if a country is a net importer of field peas, unit values from imports should be used as a more reliable price indicator. So um, this is the situation that we can see on this slide. Correct. Based on the results, we can see that the highest value of grain legumes is reflected in foreign trade, followed by the non-GMO feed value in animal production and then the conventional feed value in animal production. This shows that the current publicly available market price reporting of grain legumes does not reflect the added value potential of legumes. We have concluded that available price reporting permanently and systematically undervalues grain legumes even if we allow for a consideration of certain transaction costs. 
Okay. And how can we explain this undervaluation of trend legumes? Yeah, among other things, this can be explained by market structures that lead to information asymmetries and thus unequal bargaining positions between traders and producers. Producers of grain legumes often have a weak position in grain legume markets. Theoretically, it's expected that the price indicator based on the regression should be the same or almost the same like the reported prices. In the case of faba beans for the year 2020, we see that the producer price is higher than the price indicator based on the regression analysis. How can we explain this? This is an interesting observation. This shows that the price indicators derived from the regressions are based on past market structures. This means the main use of grain legumes in animal feed. We know that there is an increasing use of faba bean for food and the export of faba beans from Germany to countries like Egypt for food. As this trade has been increasing in the recent year, we can now observe that publicly available producer price reporting has started to reflect this change in market structures. We think that this is the reason why higher producer prices are reported than the indicator based on the regression would suggest. So therefore, we should emphasize the necessity to have a differentiation in the price reporting for grain legume. At least for food and feed, we should have a distinction of price reporting for grain legumes like faba beans and dry pea. Exactly. And we propose that a different approach is presented here can be a first step in this direction. What would be the best way to use these price indicators? Well, possibly in the beginning, the simultaneous use of the three indicators would help to identify an appropriate level of legume remuneration in line with their value adding potential. The calculated price indicators would thus constitute a price band for price negotiations between two market players. The lower price indicators would therefore be used more as a reference by the purchasing side and the higher price indicators would be used more by the selling side as a justification for price claims. Of course, specific conditions regarding quality, location, and time have to be accounted in addition. Okay, means by reducing information asymmetry in this way, the producing side could obtain better and more attractive prices for its legumes. Producer prices that better reflect the added value potentials of grain legumes. We hypothesize that such price incentives would advance the long-term supply of grain legumes and make them less dependent on, the, on direct financial support or policy intervention. Okay, thanks for this clear illustration, Marcos. Also, thank you, Bruno, for your contributions. Okay, after this first presentation from my colleague Bruno and myself, um, we, as I wrote in the in the chat, you can ask question, put your comments, and we would be happy to to interact with you. Now we will go on according to our program with the second presentation from Cindy Brown. She's from Global Pulse Confederation, and will broaden our perspective on the global um, legume market. So please start with the second presentation. Hi, I'm Cindy Dome Brown, president of Chippewa Valley Bean and the Global Pulse Confederation, which is also known as GPC. GPC represents all segments of the pulse industry value chain. Our membership includes 24 national associations and over 600 private sector members. I want to thank the organizers from Leg Value and True Project for inviting me to be part of this very important webinar today. I'm going to talk to you about the import, export, and world supply of pulses, and also about the effect that COVID-19 has had on the global pulse supply chain. And finally, just a few words about the future of pulses. Canada remains the world's largest exporter of pulses, followed by Australia, Myanmar, and the US. Farmers from Russia, the Ukraine, and other NIS countries have been increasing their production and exports over the past decade, 
as they learn about the agronomic benefits of growing pulses and how beneficial it is for their land. On the import side, the Government of India has a stated goal of self-sufficiency in pulses, and they plan to double farmers' incomes by next year, 2022. Now, India's increased pulse plantings and their favorable weather conditions have resulted in a large production increase, which in turn caused a big drop in their imports. But at the same time, China offset that somewhat by significantly increasing their pulse imports, mainly in peas for export, I'm sorry, for livestock and noodle manufacturing. We expect trade to continue somewhere around five to 10% uh, above average because of the continuing impact of COVID-19 and increasing consumer demand. Basically, supplies are in step with demand except for a few classes of beans that have been a little bit short. But you may ask, what may change? Well, the industry anticipates that India may open imports this year to control their domestic prices and meet an increase in demand. They also need to replenish stocks that they've used for public distribution during COVID-19. And it's no doubt that the military coup in Myanmar will impact exports. Let's take a look at the major classes of pulses now. We can see that pea production is down from 2020, but really it's pretty much in line with demand. Now pea exports are expected to drop slightly to 4.9 million metric tons in 2021. And it's interesting to note that at the same time, ingredient suppliers and food manufacturers in North America continue to demand more and more peas for ingredients every year. Let's look at, chick, excuse me, at Kabuli chickpeas. Shortages and high prices for Kabulis were the norm in 2016 and 17, and they, redult, they resulted in overproduction and higher inventories in 18 and 19. But because India and Mexico reduced their plantings in 2020 and the inventories leveled out, we're able to go into 2021 pretty even and strong global demand continues in chickpeas. Red lentils have increased both production and demand over the last couple of years, but global consumption has actually kept pace with the extra produ production increase. In fact, North American processors have had to raise grower prices in order to buy inventory. North America has a speckled bean variety called the Pinto, and we had a pretty large carryover in 2019, but due to the coronavirus, it was consumed in 2020 and ended up being relatively short. Uh, we expect it to go into 2021, again, hoping that plantings are very big so we don't end up with a shortfall again this year. If we look at Brazil, which is the world's largest producer and consumer of beans, they are also facing increased demand because of COVID-19. COVID-19's effect is ongoing in many different classes. And again, we see it in white bean production. Uh, we're going to need an increase because of the pandemic. And unfortunately, it looks like ending stocks for white beans are going to be slightly below average. This is not a good sign. You know, when you look at this ship stuck in the canal, for six days, one of the busiest canals was blocked when the Ever Given ran aground on March 23rd. It left over 400 ships stranded. And honestly, it was just one more fissure, one more crack contributing to the malfunction of the global transportation system. The impact of COVID-19 is a detriment in what we're trying to do in transportation. Demand for pulses is at near record levels, but shipments have been really reduced. Um, we've, we've faced a number of transportation challenges. COVID-19 has caused blanks in sailing and major container shortages. Right now, my company, Chippewa Valley Bean, is struggling, as most, most of North America is, with labor issues at the Port of Montreal and a congested rail and port infrastructure in the rest of North America. Another impact of COVID-19 is on the hungry. The pandemic and the resulting loss of income could nearly double the number of people that need food assistance and are in starvation category, 135 million to 265 million. The world's poorest people who've lost their incomes due to illness 
and job loss um, from COVID-19. They've been disproportionately impacted because of the virus. And unless they receive enough support, hunger levels will soar. The pulse industry is doing very well with many of the advances that we've seen and our future looks very, very bright. We've had some remarkable opportunities in the global pulse industry. The International Year of Pulses in 2016, World Pulses Day, and an ongoing increasing awareness of pulses and plant protein. We've had more than a thousand products launched across 17 different food categories since 2017. And I'm here to say the future of pulses looks very, very bright. So thank you for your time today and feel free to reach out to me with your questions. GPC will be hosting a number of webinars on the pulse industry over the next few months. We invite you to join us. Thank you. Thank you for this um, presentation. And uh, I would like to repeat our offer that if you would like to comment or ask questions, please put them to the chat function. Now we will go on with a live presentation by Andy Burry. He's from the Pul he's Pulse Trade Manager at Frontier Agriculture in UK. And he will talk about trading of pulses in the UK. Andy, so the floor is yours now. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see me. I think you can hear me. Yeah, there we go. Let me just put that there. Okay, how's that looking? Can everybody see the presentation, Marcus? Can you see that? Hello. Yes, Andy, we can't see it. It's okay. okay, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, so moving moving on, I shall move on with my presentation. If I just put that screen one second. Okay, um, what I'd like to do is just go through <clears throat> the value chain for UK pulses, concentrating mostly on faba beans, um, and really probably and hopefully pick up some of the points um, that Marcus uh, made uh, with Bruno as well. Uh, so in the UK, the pea crop is relatively small, uh, and the main feature for peas um, are the fact that we do need to see colour because we can't compete with the white and yellow peas uh, coming from imported products, apart from in a, a very small, uh, small way. Um, so we have a, a market split for animal feed, for micronizing, cooking, and flaking. So we have um, added value, uh, which we see there. And then um, for feed um, into animal feed, uh, it's uh, basically any green or white pea. We are beginning um, in the UK to see a little bit more development of human consumption um, for domestic grown peas uh, being manufactured into snacks in the UK. Um, bizarrely, for many years, we've exported Marifat peas, um, which have gone to the Far East and then have come back into the UK processed as wasabi peas. Uh, but we are beginning to develop some of our own uh, wasabi pea contacts here in the UK. So that's uh, that's a better job. And then there's a traditional uh, mushy tin peas, which is very much a, a UK based. Um, you could say it's, it's the UK's own form of dal, but um, that, that's a very specialist and small market. So we've seen some of these slides from Cindy um, on the uh, faba bean production, uh, and we can see uh, really that the production of faba beans is in very small um, hands in terms of the numbers of main producing countries, uh, basically the UK, Australia, uh, the Baltic states are, are certainly by far the main, the main producers. Um, so it is quite limited, although we are seeing growth uh, in certain areas. We're seeing certainly growth in Germany uh, and other parts of the um, EU. And we'll just come on to a little bit more detail of that later. Uh, and, and imports, again, uh, 
very easy to see where the bulk of uh, baba bean are going to, uh, which is for food, uh, which is principally into the Middle East and, and Egypt is by far um, the biggest consumer. Um, but we're also seeing the development of, um, again, as Marcus mentioned, aquaculture and feed beans, which have been part processed going into Norway um, and further north uh, for aquaculture, so into, into the feed side. So that's the rather large overview. Again, the markets are split, and, and I think this is important in terms of pricing, that within the European faba bean trade, we see values based on feed, and then with a premium over and above that for food. And that's one thing which a lot of growers are aware of. What is the base feed price? And then what is the premium for food if the beans are good enough for human consumption? So in the UK, um, we see feed for domestic into ruminant and monogastric compound feeds. Um, and we are also seeing a number of uh, feed plants which where the beans are blended with rapeseed uh, and then extruded, and these are going into the poultry industry. Uh, feed beans are also de-hulled in a couple of plants in the UK, uh, a little bit more detail of that later on, uh, but again, going into aquaculture, into pet foods. And then the human consumption export, uh, principally into Egypt, as I said, um, splitting for falafel, uh, where the beans are de-hulled and then split, um, or whole beans which are colour sorted and graded for cooking. Um, and also the UK uh, has its own small uh, dry bean snack, which we also see those uh, as habas fritas uh, in Spain as well. So a little bit, again, the trade flows that we see from the UK and, and these numbers are, are quite general numbers. But if we look on the left-hand side um, of the screen, the domestic uh, consumption for compound feed, this is into the uh, animal feed industry uh, and into the extruders industry, which we've just mentioned for poultry feed, uh, and also going up to um, Scotland and Norway for aquaculture. So that does take up a large part of our um, Baba beans and these feed value. Again, Marcus has been concerned about uh, the lack of transparency of values, but certainly within the UK, the premium of Faba beans to feed wheat or to feed wheat futures does give growers a very good reference point to the value that they can achieve for their feed beans on the farm. The premium uh, for export, which is principally the yellow line uh, going to Egypt, and this year is a very small um, proportion of the UK beans going to Egypt or, or into Sudan even, um, and that does pay a premium over and above, but it very much depends on quality. And quality in faba beans, the main criteria is color, and visual appearance, but also the level of insect damage. Insect damage is a, is a problem and we've seen the impact of brookid beetle. It's a very specific uh, crop pest. It's moved from central France uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, moved to northern France where the bulk of faba beans grown and now have a problem uh, with infestation Brookie beetle uh, and the density of the map, as you can see, crop year 2010 and crop year 2015, the evidence of the Brookie beetle um, moving further north in the UK and much more widespread when we get up to 2020 with the lighter colored uh, plots at the bottom of the graph showing a very high level of insect damage with less of a problem as we move further north. But inevitably and unfortunately, we're still seeing um, with current warming temperatures, uh, the impact of the infestation moving north. 
It has no impact on feed quality, but certainly makes uh, beans much less acceptable uh, for human consumption. Um, so human consumption beans on the left, we see a nice, clean, uh, bright sample, very much suitable for human consumption. And these would then be split and de-hulled. So when we talk about de-hulled beans, generally the, the outside layer is taken and removed of where the fiber is, and the beans are then split in half to make a quality product. The other market I refer to is de-hulling beans. Again, this is adding value. We're beginning to see a bigger development in de-hulled beans, uh, where the products, once the fiber is removed, uh, is then more suitable for going into aquaculture and pet foods. Uh, and this is an example of the, the de-hulling factory um, that we at Frontier involved with um, in the middle of the country. Uh, de-hulling for Scotland, uh, aquaculture, and also into, into Norway. As we can see, we start with the, the bean, the whole bean at the top. Um, and then from the bean, we get the de-hulled bean on the right. And then at the bottom, we get the hulls, uh, which we can then use and pelletize for animal feed. And these are principally going into aquaculture, just a couple of shops here. This is a, a more traditional type of um, Fish farm. And this, this two are up in Norway. Uh, we see these on the west coast of Scotland as well, uh, and strong demand for um, using faba beans as a binder with relatively high protein, um, but the price needs to be price competitive with, with wheat. Uh, and just for the, the development, you can see that the size of these fish farms and the way in which they're feeding the fish is now in bulk vessels, um, transferring to either these inland uh, locks or fields. Um, but there's now a further development in order for improving salmon health uh, to deliver to these very large um, offshore farms, which where the farms are tethered uh, to the North Sea floor and, uh, and, and the, the feed is then delivered in bulk vessels from the feed mills um, in Scotland and Norway. So some big developments. And I think we will continue to see demand for faba beans in this direction. So from a summary point of view, certainly in the UK, we continue to see strong demand for both peas and beans, for both feed and food. And we're certainly seeing um, a, a large push uh, from companies where they're looking to reduce the inclusion of soybean meal. And we know that uh, with a lot of research work that uh, faba beans can replace 100% soybean meal. Um, but it's a cost and it's also the availability of the product. So that's something which we need to overcome. Um, and as I've just finished on, we're, we're beginning to see more uh, uses for de-hulled uh, faba beans, uh, both for pet food and for aquaculture. And again, this is very much more to do with um, demand for alternative to soya. We have a number of plants in the UK using peat protein, but also now looking at uh, faba bean uh, protein uh, in order to make meat-free um, alternatives for human, human food as well. So a, a healthy environment, um, a big and important crop in the UK, but with certainly some good, uh, well-defined price mechanisms for farmers to follow in terms of linkage to wheat futures, uh, for feed beans, and then another premium on top for human consumption. So I hope that um, explains some of what we're looking to do, um, and I will hand you back to Marcus. Andy, thank you very much for your presentation and indicating that you are a little bit further advanced in quality differentiated price reporting. I think that that's helpful and that's that's necessary to give farmers the the respective incentives uh, to focus on these mark uh, on on these markets. So now we will go on to look a bit a little bit stronger into these organizational issues in value chains, how we actually um, can transfer the potential benefits at the farm level. And I'm looking forward very much to 
your presentation, Marie Benoit, Macrini. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I hand over to you. Yes, thank you, Marcus. So the previous presentation uh, su suggests uh, that we need to reinforce uh, the domestic production in Europe uh, for our consumption, for the domestic consumption, but also uh, to uh, get export markets. And uh, you know that uh, we need to increase uh, the competitive advantage of uh, the legume production in Europe. And so the presentation, the talk I prepare now, uh, will uh, present main results concerning the positive effect of highly coordinated supply chain in order to favor learning on legume production. So, Martin, you can start uh, my presentation and after the next one will be a stakeholder's presentation to illustrate those results. Cette, confé cette conférence va maintenant être enregistrée. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marie Magrini. I'm a scientist in innovation economics at INRAE, the French Research Institute on Agriculture, Food and Environment. It's my pleasure to present to you main insights about the subject of value chain organizations and more specifically here into how production contracts are used in legume value chains and to consider the positive effects of those organizational arrangements for legume development. In particular, along with this presentation, I will focus on how production contracts increase long-term investment and knowledge sharing between stakeholders that are both essential conditions for the relaunch of legumes. This analysis is based on previous theoretical works and a large empirical analysis carried out within the Lake Value project with the help of Celia Cholez, who pursued a postdoctorate in 2020 for the project. She is now pursuing another postdoctorate at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, also on the subject on value chain organization. First of all, I would like to remind you that previous works have demonstrated that legumes were, and still are, facing a strong looking situation, particularly in Europe. Our main conclusion is that legumes haven't benefited from sufficient investments in the past, making it hard to now compete with other major crops, such as wheat, for instance. This strong path dependency results in low cultivation and uses of legumes in Europe. Therefore, a particular problem recognized by most stakeholders is a clear knowledge gap related to this crop. Hence, the challenge is to foster organizational arrangements in value chains that could secure long-term investment in regards to both material and knowledge investment for legumes. But as the agricultural sector remains a lower intensive technological one, as opposed to other, few research development contracts or other classical contracts exist for fostering high investments. Therefore, we consider looking at the different ways in which contracts for exchanging goods, that is production contracts, which could also be a lever for fostering such investment. In regards to organizational economics, those contracts are considered as an intermediate way for coordinating crop transaction between stakeholders. There is a more secure way than in spot markets to guarantee the qualities expected without being in a complete integration form when a single firm owns every production and processing step. So our main motivations were to understand the ways in which production contracts were used um, were used by the value chain stakeholders and to see if there were differences between countries and crops. 
and what were the effects of the organizational arrangements on investment security concerning both material and knowledge development for fostering legume development. I believe that this analysis is important for developing sound agricultural policies according to the ways farmers are involved in value chains this can contribute or not to developing long-term and shared investments. The results I will now introduce are based on 10 legume value chains that were analyzed in seven of the countries involved in the Lake Value project and presented on this slide. Last year, we addressed a survey to those stakeholders and conducted open-ended interviews. For each value chain, we question one main representative of the stakeholders involved in the value chain, a farmer, an intermediate organization, and a processor. Some of whom have accepted to speak during this webinar, and this will complete our presentation. So I would like to give a big thank to you, to all the stakeholders who accepted to answer our study and on this strategic subject and participate in the webinar. Um, so, as you can see, some value chains deal with feed, but most deal with food. Some are based on organic production, while most of them on conventional production a paradigm. And apart from the case of a p-value chain in UK, uh, most of the case studies started crop production contract recently. So the, vast, the, the diversity of uh, the value chain we study as, we, as regards species, outlet and countries was an important element for, uh, of this study, revealing how those characteristics had no particular influence on the organizational arrangement chosen and the way production contracts were used. So, um, concerning the main insights, uh, as, uh, as I have explained in my introduction, a production contract is an agreement on the price and on the production conditions or specific qualities that are expected by the buyer. In most cases, we observe that there was a chain of contracts in the way that production contracts exist between an intermediary and a farmer and between an intermediary and the processor. Most of the time, the contracts between the processor and the intermediary generate those with the farmers. In two cases, we observe that some contracts were directly drawn up with farmers for all the processor supply, like in Latvia for P, or for just a part of it. In addition, we observe several creation of what we call multi-party organizational arrangements that links together the different main stakeholders of the value chain. This is very important. It facilitates the bargaining process and the sharing of strategic information to improve the competitiveness in the value chain in regards to decision making on investment sizes or technical knowledge that needs to be solved and many other problems that stakeholders face with young value chain. Also, uh, some organizational arrangement concerns the grouping of intermediary organizations such as, such as collect or storage steps. The idea being also that the more the organization of producer or collectors is structured, they will have more power when bargaining with processors. Now, if we take a closer look at some of the clauses in these production contracts, we can observe. For all of them, the objective of price setting is to be incentive for farmers with a minimum guarantee prices, uh, favoring stability and so encouraging long-term involvement with legume crops. 
Most price settings are based on the variable part linked to the price of other markets, notably wheat, which is a major crop for farmers in Europe, or a certain specific qualities that could result in price decrease when the expected qualities are not achieved. Qualities are mostly linked to the choice of seed varieties and certain production conditions. And the choice of certified seed favor investment in the breeding sector as breeders get more returns from those value chains. As you know, seeds are a major concern in the relaunch of legumes. Many production contracts favor the use of certified seed. And this could be considered as an additional lever for investment in the legume sector. Those investments concern both material and knowledge. It is important to consider both. The theory of organizational arrangement in economics explains how contracts like these are first used for securing material investments which link to the transaction under study. But what we, what we observe is that those material investments are not so specific in legume value chains. The reason being, as a stakeholder explained, that, for example, the factories that have been developed to process legumes can be readapted for other crops. And even though such a readjustment incurs extra costs, this extra investment is not considerable. In addition, farmers don't need to invest in specific material. In fact, we understood that the production contract governance is mainly used to secure the launching of investment, particularly at the beginning, until the first returns of those investments, and this could take a decade or even more. While material investments were considered as not so highly specific with legume, knowledge investment appeared more specific. Most stakeholders recognized that at the beginning of the value chain, there was a major knowledge gap on the legume crops that the value chain wanted to solve. It was therefore important to organize knowledge sharing and exchanging in order to reduce this knowledge gap. As the stakeholders consider this knowledge as highly specific, we consider that the production contract governance were a means to securing investments in knowledge that remain costly. And for economists, this is also linked to externality problems. For instance, those investments can't be used in supporting specific advice for farmers. Hence, what was particularly interesting was to observe how the production contract governance favors knowledge sharing between stakeholders in the value chain. Those effects on knowledge did not receive much consideration in the past in regards to the theory of organizational economics. Therefore, our results provoke new consideration on the role of contracts on value chain development. First, the way in which such contracts are governed generates more social interaction such as face-to-face -face interaction when negotiating contracts or special events that bring the farmers of the value chain together. And all these contributes towards more knowledge sharing. Second, this knowledge sharing is also reinforced through the technical advice support developed by the value chain. And third, for most case studies, the stakeholders invest in organizing the collection of technical data for analysis in order to develop adapted advice for farmers. So, to conclude, we believed that highly coordinated value chain from agri-food firms up to farmers can speed up the agri-food transition we are aiming towards. The production contracts we studied 
clearly create more group commitments with specific investment in breeding, advice for farmers, and so forth, and also informal interactions for knowledge sharing. Hence, those highly coordinating supply chain favor more learning effects and therefore progress on legume crops cultivation that are beneficial for all stakeholders. We all know that learning takes time, and so this type of coordination on a long-term perspective is appropriate for legume development. Finally, in regards to policies, we cannot upload that these contractual markets generate a stronger leverage effect on crop subsidies because commodities market, or what we call spot markets, didn't generate long-term investment for legume cultivation in Europe in the past. This is an important point to consider for future legume policies. The following presentation delivered by different stakeholders involved in highly coordinating supply chain with production contract would explain more. You find here several publications on this subject and the current study. So thank you for your attention and your patience. I hope my pronunciation was okay and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. So the first talk uh, to illustrate uh, this presentation on value chain organization will be a presentation from Guillaume Cheneau from Valorex in France about the Fababin value chain for premium feed. Hello, my name is, is uh, Guillaume Cheneau. I'm in charge of research and innovation in Valorex. And I'm responsible of our raw material sourcing too. Valorex is an SME company from Brittany in France. We are known a lot in France, but at European level too, for a large development on oleaginous linseed for 20 years because we organized its production in different regions in France because we created know-how in cooking process for a better use in animal and human nutrition and because we launched a private label that highlights the nutritional benefits for the consumer. Its name is Bleu Blanc Coeur. A success story in France. For five years, relying on our know-how and experiences, Valorex built a very big research and development program with Hinlay, with the aim of reducing soybean imports and deforestation by introducing legumes into the soil to be cultivated by an adapted and patented cooking process and by animal feed that use its rich protein seeds, highly digestible. Our organization brings together all stakeholders from seed production to its use on animal production. Currently, the specification of animal production system like GMO-free local origin etc. don't recognize in us the added value of this organization and this feed production, even if it's in adequation with consumers' expectations. But we hope in the future, and we already prepare it, developing Fababin first with P, Lupin and Soybean in association in our feed solution. How we do it with our suppliers? We contract in advance with our suppliers and farmers with a guaranteed minimum and maximum price 
and with an indexation on other set prediction. We put forward this contract system with a price supplement which guarantees the use of certified seeds, the traceability of cultivation practices, and the quality of the seed. At the moment, for the start, we are contracting for a requirement of 15 tons, 15,000 tons in 22 in France. In the other hand, thanks to the added value generated by our process for breeders, thanks to our efforts to create added value for consumers through agronomic and environmental impacts, we are also investing in new storage cells, in industrial processing lines, and in R&D programs to further improve our business model. But that's a big risk. All our strategy is based on an important part of risk. We hope we won't be too early. We wish to be supported to reduce this risk because we believe that we are that we have all the ingredients for transition to agroecology. Thank you very much for your attention. Long life to Long legumes, life to legumes with, our current with our future, current future partner. partner. So it was a first presentation from Valvex about premium feed and the development of uh, Fababin supply chain for Valorex was based, uh, is still based on the production contract to create incentives for farmers. Now uh, we will listen to a presentation from uh, Carlos Pereira. Uh, from Portugal as regards the organization of uh, value chain on chickpea uh, for food. Good morning everyone. Uh, so my presentation is about the organization of a chickpea value chain in Portugal and I represent the AECF Agro Innovação. So, in the last six years, we have been developing a value chain for the chickpea crop, which goes from the field to the consumer. In our region, Alentejo region, you can see our production areas with a red market and with a black, with a black market cooperatives and association that work in partnership with us. This slide shows a schematic overview of the chickpea value chain in Portugal. Uh, we, uh, AECF, are the intermediary organization. We buy certified seed, in our case, the Elvar variety, of which we have the exclusivity in Portugal, acquired from the seed company in south of France, Arterrich. In 2020, the variety Viana uh, was obtained by us, included the national catalog of varieties. Furthermore, we provide technical support of the production fields uh, to a farm network with more than 50 farmers distributed throughout the Alentejo region. Input supplier are another actor of the value chain likely cooperatives and association that supply the products required, made pest control and storage the seeds. All last we clean, at last we cleaning, calibrating and packing the production according to the industry requirements. One of the processor of small compound group where the production are sold to the human consumption Byproducts resulting for the cleaning uh, and calibration are sold to the animal feed industry. All of the value chain of uh, chickpea 
were supported by research centers, namely INAV and University of Evora. So determination the prices it buys from farmers. The AECF considers the fixed price strategy because if there is a changing in the annual uh, price, it would not be possible to have a constant production volume. With this, we, make, we made a three years contract with farmers in our region uh, with prices that always constant, is always the same uh, price. These are the advantage and the guarantee for the farmers that there, there are no fluctuations in price. So um, our crop chickpeas are not an agriculture commodity. So prices are not defined globally by the international market, but according to the, produce, to the world big producers. Uh, for example, uh, India, it's the biggest one, or uh, United States of America, Canada, or in the uh, South of America, uh, Argentina, Argentina, or, or uh, Mexico. This leads to large fluctuation in the value of the sale price, as it is uh, dependent uh, on the climate conditions of the larger producers. This creates uncertainty, as uncertainty uh, for all actors in the production chain. Our work with customer uh, has led to the need for fixing, fixing uh, the, price, the sale price, which is a flow assurance. The fixed price strategy allows, allows uh, the value chain to be strengthened. So, uh, this is uh, uh, my presentation. My presentation. Thanks, uh, thanks to, uh, to uh, your, uh, your attention. So it was a presentation on food. We will now have two other short presentation for a feed value chain and another one for food value chain. We alternate uh, the supply chain to show you that the highly coordination of value chain is possible before food or before sheep. So the next one is uh, in Switzerland for soybean. Um, and the presenter is uh, present with us today, so you can also ask questions for him. Hello everybody, my name is Nathan Schmid and I work for FIBL, uh, the Swiss Research Center uh, for Organic Agriculture in Switzerland. I will show you today my uh, presentation about uh, organic soybean valley chain and for that I will share my presentation. Okay, the topic today is how can contracts uh, be used to stabilize prices, increase knowledge and know-how and secure quality and investments at each actor's level. The main actors in this value chain are uh, the cooperative of farmers, organic farmers, um, which do some, does some consulting of farmers, research projects, uh, market contacts with the main players, and have a very close collaboration with FIBO. Second main actor is the mill, Mulleritz, which is responsible for collecting, first cleaning, drying, secondary cleaning, store removal, and packaging, but also uh, responsible for this close uh, relation with the market, with the customers and the, the industry. Advantages of this collaboration is the good relations to the farmers, consulting of experienced farmers to less experienced ones through exchange of know-how, strong mill experience in crop sorting, and uh, also because of the fact that buying directly from the farmer is a big train in retail in Switzerland today. Um, Progana and Mulleritz made a strong agreement with Coop, the second biggest retailer in Switzerland. And they took these opportunities of uh, long-term strategic cooperation agreements and also took this opportunity to um, bring some new product uh, from organic soybean on the market like tofu and uh, milk. Uh, challenges, um, the idea was to bring uh, 
soybean on the market and to produce it in Switzerland, but uh, the challenge was to get the price that can compete with the good prices uh, given to the farmers producing cereal today. So uh, to be attractive, the soybean had to, to have a, a very competitive price too. The idea of this agreement was to guarantee this price and COP gave uh, from the beginning uh, a price enough competitive to, to be able to um, uh, give the farmer uh, the, the, the guarantee necessary. The World Wide Chain has been uh, coordinated by uh, Feeble till today. Um, about the contracts, uh, we have different contracts level and uh, the two most important are, of course, the disagreements between the cooperative, the mill and, and the coop, the, the retailer. But uh, after that, the second most important is, of course, the contract between the, the mill and the farmer. And uh, this contract is based on quantity and quality standards. Also important is the contract between the mill and the, in the industry with uh, the quality standards and at the end to be able to bring the product on the, onto the market is of course the contract between the industry and the retailer. Um, in that uh, picture uh, and with this uh, configuration, uh, 60 organic farmers were convinced from the beginning and started with production. Here you have the whole picture of all the main players and um, you see that we included also, uh, which is very important, the breeding uh, research center, agroscope and the, produce, the seed producers um, to have enough seeds um, produced and um, so in Switzerland and also the quality test center um, and uh, all the food processors, processors tests uh, for the industry for milk and tofu. Um, building a value chain is not possible without building confidence and sharing realities uh, between the, the main actors. That's why um, we organized a lot of meetings, uh, field days, um, um, mill visits, and um, to be able to share this reality of the crop production, uh, transformation, collecting, drying, so that every player knows uh, the reality of each of uh, the member of this value chain. Um, about the documents and information to the farmer first, maybe um, each, year, each farmer uh, receives uh, a covering letter with uh, the information about the next uh, crop season with the requirement, the uh, quality standards necess necessary to be able to um, have a, a contract and uh, the contract itself with uh, the quality standards, the varieties necessary to be uh, sown, the price, the, quanti the quantity uh, given to the farmers to, to produce, etc., etc., And that is signed before uh, sowing time. Um, with this confidence between the, the main actors and players, the price building was quite easy. Uh, everybody was uh, uh, understanding that uh, a, a fixed price is necessary to start with production. So they uh, fixed the price to um, 1,900 euro per ton from the beginning. Um, did, you, did you think some cost for uh, cleaning, drying, etc.? They also had a strategy to uh, collect uh, the whole grain um, um, with uh, one single collection and cleaning point uh, that was uh, for quality reasons and to avoid mixes with other grain. So uh, no local grain collectors has been involved in this process. So in, soybean is delivered directly from the farmers to collecting center reeds. And uh, the farmers that are uh, a bit far away from the mill, uh, they are compensated for the transport. Um, quality criteria uh, for organic food soybean are very, very important. And uh, the most important ones are uh, contamination with other crop, can, uh, which can be can exceed, uh, can't exceed 3%, broken grain 4%, discolored grain maximum. 5%. Uh, if these limits are exceeded, 
uh, soybean for food is downgraded to feed uh, quality for half of the price or uh, uh, sorted with an optical sorting machine, but it, uh, it, uh, uh, it gives an extra cost of uh, 265 euro uh, per ton, including transport. Here you can see a picture of how uh, the soybean production is uh, going now in Switzerland. And you can see that it started from very, uh, very, uh, very low um, quantities. And it's growing and growing every year with the uh, confidence of the market and some new opportunities. Uh, interesting is to see how uh, the feed quality is growing too. And uh, the last uh, information uh, from the different mills is that they made a call in uh, for 2021 and asking for more uh, for 2,500 hectares needed, um, for, uh, principally in, in feed quality for feed soybean and other legumes for feed uh, production. Um, and important decisions uh, taken about two years ago what, uh, to, uh, from the farmers, the Swiss organic farmers, was to um, uh, feed maximum 5% of concentrates uh, to the ruminant and 100% uh, of uh, the fodder uh, must be produced in Switzerland. That gives obvious, obviously an opportunity for indigenous protein production. And uh, we observe now um, a clear food and feed parallel strategy uh, of uh, legume production and a very complementary tariff market strategy, uh, which means um, we produce first for food with high quality standards and which uh, the part that uh, doesn't reach this quality goes to the feed quality with the uh, an extra uh, production of really for uh, only for feed. So conclusions uh, is that uh, these agreements uh, or contracts between the stakeholders allow the farmers to get involved with a new crop with price security. The farmers get a, a lot of experience to reach the required quality for food soybean. They invested in machines that allow them to grow other legumes like lupine and fava bean. They developed a new market for indigenous proteins for food. They are today confident to start growing feed protein for a low price. New partners invest in own uh, national selection and seed production and new collecting centers are now investing in modern uh, uh, cleaning units to receive pure and seed pure and uh, legume crops. Uh, legume crops. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. <clears throat> so I, I would like to give a big thank to Nathaniel for this very detailed uh, presentation that is a very good illustration on the way supply chain could be highly coordinating to generate positive effects uh, such as learning, uh, security price for farmers and so on, and to highlight also the complementarity uh, market strategy between food and feed. Uh, to finish about uh, those um, illustration on the way value chain are coordinating, uh, we will now uh, listen to a short testimony from Rocket. Um, Rocket, uh, a very big industry on uh, P that use protein P uh, that will uh, give a, a testimony on the fact that uh, this industry is also convinced on the need to reinforce So Martin, uh, okay. Good morning, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to share with you today the p-value chain for peace protein bill by Rocket in France. For who doesn't know already Rocket, Rocket is a global leader in plant-based ingredients, is a pioneer of plant protein and the leading provider of a pharmaceutical excipient. 
takes uh, to a constant drive innovation and the long term vision, the group Rocket is committed to improving the well being for a million people in the world. Rocket currently operates in uh, over than 100 countries as a turnover of around 3.7 billion euro and the employees 8,670 people worldwide. Rocket is also a very important uh, R&D department in Letram with uh, more than 300 people involved. Rocket is one of the pioneers in the plant protein specialties for food, nutrients, and the earth's markets. With more than 40 years experience producing plant-based protein from wheat, corn, and with more than 15 years experience in pea processing in the plant in Vixoren in France. With more than 70 patents for peas application and product. The ambition of Roquette is to become the long-term leader in the new plant protein specialties for human consumption by offering high performance and sustainable solutions. But to be a leader, we must met the consumer expectation for safe and sustainable food in the world. We expect in the world more than 9-7 billion people in 2050, with a huge, very huge increase of the demand of food. And uh, Rocket commit to answer and satisfy the consumer expectation. Food and the raw materials has to comply not only with the existing regulation in the different parts in the world, especially in UA, Americas and Far East, but uh, we need also to answer to the demand from the consumer are more and more interested not just on food, but also on safety, naturality of the food, nutritional characteristic and price. And on top of that, they also ask for a sustainability for the sourcing and purchasing. To meet uh, this uh, challenge, Roquette has implemented a dedicated supply chain for yellow peas in France. To we develop our supply chain. These two streams are uh, agronomy and logistic. Agronomy, we pay attention and we focus mainly on a strict implementation of the growing protocol for best growing practices. Having agronomical, having the full traceability, as we used to say, from the farm to the fork. Then all along the logistic, pay attention to the risk of uh, cross-contamination. So we have also a very strict procedure for tracking crops from field to the silo. Obviously, the final validation of the process is made by the people from the quality of Roquette and also on the product that is delivered to the plant in Vic Suren. But, uh, Implementing an efficient uh, supply chain is not easy. It is not possible to do alone. But we built and we work to build a very strong relationship with farmer based on a fair trade. The first step has been to define best growing practices involving farmers and cooperative in a practice uh, work at first, but also including the seed breeder in order to identify the best suitable variety varieties to produce protein from peas. Roquette is also dedicated agronomist team to support directly farmer to implement the protocol for best growing practices. We create then 
a value chain for all the players of the new supply chain based on three pillars, stability, giving the option for multi-year contract for the growers, transparency, offering transparent mechanism for setting price, and the fair price, proposing milling with the price as underlying for peace, with the opportunity to manage the risk on the native market for the farmers. And the last but not the least, giving a special premium to the farmer for the high quality and the sustainable yellow peas. So, so I hope you enjoy those uh, short presentation uh, from different value chain, that's their organization. And now Marcus will introduce another presentation. Oh, your micro, Marcus. Exactly. Coming from a global uh, company, we now come to a small startup company but in the same way starting with developing an innovative um, supply chain so now we are going to watch the presentation from Cecilia Antoni she's the founder of uh, Bonicat a startup company based in Berlin and I hope you will enjoy the presentation Okay, today we have uh, Ms. Cecilia Antoni from Bonicat and she will give us an idea about her company and what she does with the product Fava Bean. Um, my colleague Bruno, he is working in the project Leg Value together with me and uh, he will ask a few questions and thanks very much for having this today. Thanks Wolfgang. Hello Cecilia. Yeah, hello. Thanks for the invitation. Bonicard um, is my company. I founded it in 2019. We got a Berlin startup stipendium scholarship for it, and we got the opportunity to use a um, food technology department at the Beuth Hochschule, which is a university here in Berlin. And we uh, developed the Ackerbohn snack, which is uh, our, which is made of fava bean. It's our first product. It's uh, uh, the faba bean uh, roasted and you can eat it as a snack or for appetizer or um, as topping. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we started in 2019 and our first test run was in a few months later in uh, some stores. And from then on, we, we are happy to use our snack. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> And maybe you can give us a short um, overview about the history of the company. What was your motivation to found it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, quite long a long time ago, I started already um, um, experimenting with local beans in Germany at the time when nobody was really interested in beans and peas and lentils. And uh, so I, sta I started a food blog in 2009. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, developed some recipes, uh, very special recipes, ice cream, pizza, hamburger, everything. <laughs> and then I, um, uh, at the beginning, nobody actually was interested. I started in English, everybody was interested, and I switched to German, nobody was interested in, in my food blog. But I said, okay, the, my market is, is Germany. And then, um, yeah, I started um, to experiment with the fava bean, which is actually my favorite bean. And um, I made this Akabon snack. Um, yeah, that's short history. Now coming to the raw material, where do you source your fava beans from? In other words, where do you get your raw materials? Yeah, I get my beans uh, directly from the farmers. I um, usually I visit the farmers uh, or they um, send me um, samples mm -hmm. and I also go to the fields and look at the plants, look they healthy, 
because for me, it's very important to, to have a good quality of beans. And therefore, I'm I'm looking everywhere in Germany around <laughs> which farmer has the best bean. Yeah. And um, about the quality, quantity, prices, and the delivery modality, how are these parameter or criteria determined? Um, yeah, the the for me is um, the quality is the key. So I need beans which um, look very good without holes, any holes, without uh, uh, beetle infestations, without uh, to be stunned. So I, um, when I do a first, I do a uh, test run, and then I um, look um, if the taste is good, and. Um, and it's also for us it's important because we are still a small company um, that um, we can't um, actually at the moment work with really big farmers. For them, we are, we are too small. Um, the quantity of the beans are not enough yet. Um, but we, we, pay usually, we pay our um, farmers a really good price. So um, because we want to have a, we are fair to, to the farmers, we are fair to the environment and to our customers. So it's our concept. And uh, therefore um, we are small, but we, um, we are for some small farmers, we are a good match. Okay. And how does the farmer get into the business with Bonnycard? I mean, um, at the beginning it was quite hard, but now p uh, farmers call me and ask me if I want their um, beans. And uh, yeah, then I have usually a look so it, uh, at it and uh, then I decide if it's it's a match or not. Sometimes it's I have really nice looking beans, but um, okay. they're, but I, for they're too light or they're something different, I can't use for my production. So it's um, at the moment, it's still, we are trying out a lot. So just for me to understand, um, you're just sourcing organic beans. There's no conventional uh, beans. Yeah. You're just going for the organic. Uh, we use only organic um, ingredients, mm -hmm. and um, that's yeah, that's our main thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now come to the next point about. Um, let us speak about your marketing or the marketing of your products. What characterize the target market or your target, uh, the target group you sell your products to? Mm, I would say our customers are very well informed about health, about nutrition, about environment, healthy environment, and um, yeah, they look for um, for products which are um, local or from Germany. Or, or also manufactured. So they, um, our customer, they're very aware because they don't want to uh, make a plastic food a waste or okay. so they, um, and it's also for our product, it's very good in, in to be in smaller stores because uh, the people can can try them first before, before they uh, buy them. Um, and, um, and we are um, make it different because we are not in the supermarket. The smaller stores have also an extra you, um, for the customers to say, we have something special for you. You don't get in other stores, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And talking about your customer or your, the, the target group, do you have the impression is many people who are vegetarian or they are all um, category? Who are in your products. Yeah, I think the, the pulse is say to draw first a vegetarian or vegan people. But then um, I also can see that because it's such an um, unusual product in Germany, many people are curious and try them, even if they um, not vegetarian or so. And um, they they like the, the the taste of it and then the idea behind it and then it's for them it's it's fascinating that such a small um, company um, makes such a a product which they have never seen before yeah.
Good. And um, can you tell us where we can find your products? Yeah, it's um, around, I, actually at the moment there are around, I think six, six or seven uh, unpackaged stores in the whole Germany, and uh, but also in bars and in, um, in some for, uh, pharma stores and um, also some um, special uh, specialized like concept stores and in our online shop. Okay. And uh, what are currently the biggest uh, challenges to make Bonicat events more successful? Yeah, um, the production and getting the, the, the good quality of beans. That's um, always very challenging. Um, and also to um, to grow the production in a good way because we do we are still manufacturing. We we want to have the um, the production under under our control. So um, okay. yeah, and that's uh, the heart of of the whole uh, company, the production. Hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, we are nearing the end of this interview. Maybe you can tell us something about your ambitions. So what development do you expect around Faba beans in the next year? Yeah, I think the Faba bean will be um, becoming more and more popular as a human food. Until now, many people in Germany don't know the Faba bean at, at all or only as an animal feed. Um, I think that will change in the, in the soon future. and. Um, and right now, the the fava bean is already used at, as um, as flour in in many bakery products, and I I think that will yeah it will become po more popular. Okay, why do you see Bonicat in the next five to ten years? Yeah, Bonicat is um, like the beans we use organic, so we also want to grow organic. We are like um, a company. Um, which um, is not a startup anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we, we want to be um, um, fair to our farmers, but also fair to the environment, customers, and to ourselves. So it's, um, um, it's a bit more slowly growing, but steady. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your time and uh, the illustration and uh, good luck for the continuation and the development of your activities. Good luck Thank for you so the much. continuation <laughs> and the development. So now to finish this uh, webinar, do not hesitate uh, to put your comment or question. We have seen uh, some of them. And now we have a, a last presentation from Terunivia. Uh, with uh, Abdoulaye Traoré that will present uh, some results as regard the analysis of the different qualities on legumes uh, according to various market. So it is an overview of uh, qualities criteria that are checked in Europe. Hello everybody, welcome. Today we are going to talk about legume quality management. Maëlle Simon from Terminivia, which is the French interbranch association for oil and protein sectors. Hello everyone, I'm Abdoulaye Traoré, economic researcher at uh, Terminivia. Quality is an important topic for markets and value change development. Knowledge by value change actors of the quality management system and the quality criteria considered in exchange is a key element for the development of exchange. We begin this presentation by uh, conceptual frameworks of uh, safety and quality standards. Safety and quality standards are minimum requirement developed by a public authority to make a food uh, safe and clean. Uh, private organizations intervene also in the development uh, of uh, quality standard by giving advice and make proposition to uh, public authority. Quality standards are defined to 
segregate uh, products in similar category and describe them with uh, consistent terminology that uh, can be understood by market participants. Quality standard can refer to product quality uh, like uh, grain size or grain color, product safety, uh, heavy metal or pesticide residue, uh, product authenticity uh, like uh, official sign of quality. Uh, quality standard can be uh, developed by uh, government or industry association uh, in, the, in such um, case that I qualified as a uh, De jure. De facto quality standards are standards developed by uh, uh, no organized uh, structure and come from micro decision. Standard developed by uh, public authority to make products safe are then implemented by uh, dedicated uh, services to make sure that the stakeholder comply with uh, regulation and requirements. To verify that uh, the regulations are fully respected by uh, stakeholder and industry, uh, public authority or the dedicated services um, make a certification, uh, testing, inspection, or registration, or registration of requirements. In this report, we run two types of analysis. Firstly, an analysis of legume quality management system which focuses on the EU, France, the US, Australia, and Canada. We describe the regulatory framework governing the definition and management of quality standards, the public and the private organization involved in quality management, the system defining, monitoring, and controlling quality. Secondly, we run an analysis on quality standards which focuses on de facto and de jure legume quality standard. We compare for each legume species, field peas, faba bean, soybean, lentils, and chickpeas, the quality standard in, in force in two countries. Today, we present you some of the results of this report. Quality management in a uh, studied uh, country in this report uh, can be uh, uh, classified in uh, three systems. We have a system one uh, where we have uh, France and um, European Union. The system two uh, concern Canada and United States and the system three uh, is represented by Australia. And there's uh, three systems. We have some uh, principles that are shared by uh, all of the all of this uh, country. Quality management uh, as is uh, laid by public authority with uh, which draw regulation deadline and ensure enforcement. Food industry uh, and contribute to the quality management by giving advice and making proposition to uh, public authority. In the system one. The public authority are represented by uh, European Commission uh, that which uh, set up regulation that that uh, are, that then are applied in uh, member states. Private organizations intervene in uh, this uh, quality management, uh, but we have not a uh, uh, legume uh, industry association at uh, EU level. In the system uh, two. Public authority are represented by Department of Agriculture and of uh, Health, which uh, outline standard, which, which outline standard. The standards are then uh, interpreted by local uh, government to adapt to adapt to adapt uh, them in uh, local condition. Private organization in system two are organized and intervene in um, national quality uh, implementation. In the system three. Uh, food standard Australia and New, New Zealand uh, develop quality standard for both uh, country Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, after uh, the, this development, the state and territory in Australia set up a standard that are applied in uh, each uh, state and territory. Private organ organizations are organized in Australia and intervene more in um, quality management uh, process at the uh, local government uh, level. 
quality standards are approached in uh, uh, different system in different uh, are approached differently in uh, the, the different system. We have a great system in Australia, Canada, and United States, and a addendum system in uh, France. We have not uh, a, a, an organized system at uh, EU level. A great system are defined by public authority for specialized services which work with the uh, legume industry. So, uh, survey data are collected by legume grower on, on voluntary basis and treated by public authorities and uh, private organizations which are uh, public authorization. In France, addendum are established from uh, survey data also provided by legume industry and distributed by uh, Paris Grand Trade Association, the Legumes Operator Confederation. It defines uh, the quality standard required for marketing of uh, grain and the method of, of analysis of the uh, different quality criteria. Here is an example of the quality criteria considered for faba beans in France and in Australia. For information, faba beans are often exported as food to Egypt. We see that the moisture content and the foreign material content are considered in both countries. Foreign material include dead insects in France, while there is a de dedicated criteria in Australia. We see other quality criteria related to the grain visual quality, such as the content of broken and split grain in France, and the content of defective grain in Australia, which include broken and split grains. Based on our analysis, we saw that quality criteria are similar between legume species and countries, but their name, their definition, and their method of evaluation can vary. Quality criteria mainly refer to the moisture content, the grain load cleanliness, and the grain visual quality. But currently, the nutritional composition of the grain is not considered as a determining quality criteria. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, this has been our last presentation and I would like to ask all presenters who are still present with us to uh, switch on their, their cameras to, so that we can open the more general discussion. Um, I would probably start um, reading a, a question from the, um, from, from the question menu. Um, and it refers to the type of faba beans. Um, so I just read it probably. When you talk about faba bean for food, do you mean uh, faba major, minor, or echina? Um, who feels competent to answer this question? I think it's faba beans, faba minor. Because the a major is um, is the big one for um, for conserve mainly. Or do you have something to add? Actually, I I feel not qualified to answer. It's faba bean mino. It's the small okay. grain. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. Natanya, I think you answered some of the questions already directly in, in, in the chat. Um, I think that was um, helpful. So I would like to ask everybody who, who's with us, um, please write your question in the chat or I'm not sure question who the organizers would be able also to, to the participants and directly ask their questions into the forum. I think it's for me it would be fine to directly bring your question here. Yeah, also if you have any comment or misunderstanding about uh, the different presentation, we can answer some uh, question or discuss about some points that were 
is infinite. If not, I would ask a, a question to, to Nathaniel. Um, I would, I, my impression is that the retailer was really a key player in your case study, in your example. Um, what motivated your retailer to, to start, initiate, or to, to take such a strong role in this supply chain? And in the end, to, to guarantee really attractive prices. Your microphone, Nathaniel, is not suitable. Okay. Uh, one thing I can say is that uh, uh, this retailer was very important in the beginning. It's not anymore. I mean, the, uh, the, the value chain has been reinforced during all these years, and now we've got uh, a lot of different uh, uh, customers and different actors. That means that if it, at the beginning this actor was very important to start all the process, it, this, this actor is not that important anymore because we have plenty of different opportunities. But um, uh, what really uh, was the interest of this uh, retailer in the beginning uh, is that uh, historically this retailer has been working on the ecologic um, development of different kind of um, food. And uh, it's one of the retailers in Switzerland that is um, financing a lot of research and um, developing uh, development of different kind of production. and. Um, also, as FIBL, we have a strong uh, collaboration with this retailer. Uh, we've got uh, financing to um, work on different um, uh, improvement of uh, organic process and production. So historically, I would say that this uh, big retailer is very important for us to develop organic production in Switzerland. But uh, it's not always the case that at the end, it, uses the results of this research. That means that he finances some research, but that doesn't mean that he uses then at the end the results and for him. But it has at the end impact on the whole market for a different, uh, maybe a smaller actors. And then we can use the results, the scientific uh, results, the, the practice uh, of the different farmers and, and so on. So that it's quite interesting that uh, this uh, retailer uses a part of his of its budget to to improve uh, organic um, development in Switzerland. For market reason, for course, of course. <laughs> yes, in that way, it illustrates the spillovers. The knowledge also spillovers of uh, such development. Yes. Marie, I would be interesting. You mentioned at the end that there would be more leverage for policy uh, to support legumes apart from subsidies. What kind of policy instruments would help to? to enable supply chains to establish more long more more contract arrangements well, how can policy facilitate this process um, i'm not sure there is specific policy to encourage to help stakeholders to meet together and to decide the right contract because it is a, a strategic decision for the stakeholders but I think that we can orientate some subsidies in favor of uh, long-term organized value chain because uh, it could create a leverage effect as regards investment. Because we know also that uh, the private investments that are made through a highly coordinated value chain will create what we call spillovers we create a diffusion of the knowledge developed by those stakeholders that invest in the value chain. And so in the way to 
uh, support this mobilization by, for instance, uh, financing R&D projects uh, to help them to invest in research, uh, in developing knowledge, in developing new processing, etc. I, I found it legitimate because uh, the organization of those value chain will create positive externalities that will in turn benefit for other actors that are not involved in the value chain because of uh, spillover mechanism. I see your point, especially to, to break o open these lock-ins, um, to make an initial start which could finally lead to a, to a self-supporting process, but to, to get the initial um, uh, lock-out <laughs> to mm. say, uh, to, to start it. Okay, thank you. Please feel free, all other people, persons uh, who, who are with us here. Otherwise, you have also the email address on most of the presentation, and you can also contact uh, any uh, presenter to have uh, additional information. Uh, and uh, the presentation will be uh, 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 for, uh, available for free on the website on uh, the Lake Value project perhaps also we can record it um, if you want to have a replay of the presentation or to share them with other persons. Okay, okay perfect. Then we will probably close here, Marie. Okay, thanks everybody for your interest. Um, and of course, we'd, we would like to invite you also to the next webinar, which is scheduled on, somebody can help me, webinar number four, probably next um, week on Tuesday, I suppose, but I'm not sure. Uh, please check our webpage. Uh, the series will go on and we will have um, a few interesting webinars uh, coming up within this series. So thank you very much again for your interest. Enjoy your day. All the best. See you next time. Stay healthy and well. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.